So I'll be giving a few examples of concurrent data structures. Probably only one, depending on how much time I have. But the point is to illustrate the issues that come up in uh, this kind of program. Okay. But before we go into it, we saw in the morning uh, Professor Kamal's lecture various uh, details about programming concurrency. Okay. I'll I will touch upon a few other issues. I will start with a simple example. Okay. Suppose you have 10 processors let us say. Okay. Your aim is to divide among these 10 processors a particular task. The task is to list out all prime numbers from 1 to 5 million let us say. Okay. So, how would you divide the task? When you have, if you have one, if you have just one processor what would you do? You would go through, you would first check if one is a prime, if it is you write it in a file otherwise you do not, then you would check if two is a prime and so on and so forth, you would go in sequential order. What if you had 10 processors? Shamsundar, what would you do? It will be uh, uh, nth number to n modulo 10. Why so complicated? Why not give 1 to 1 million, uh, yeah, I mean whatever, 1 to 500,000 to processor 1 and so on. Because uh, the first few numbers will compute very quickly. And yeah. So the first few numbers you can check for their primality much quicker than uh, you know numbers that come later. Okay. So you might okay. So you might divide the task up as he says. Okay, give one here, two here, three here, ten here, and then come back eleven here, and so on. So that's one way of dividing the task. But still, you know, for instance, even numbers you can discard off. You can discard very easily. So you might want to do some pre-processing there. And uh, you know, even after this. There might be some huge numbers which are, uh, which you can easily detect to be composite numbers, right? And some small numbers which you can, which might take some smaller numbers which might take much more time because they are actually prime. Let's say. Okay. So <coughs> your scheme might work, but one can do a further improvement, okay? Which is to say that I'll not fix any distribution at all, okay? Instead, what I'll do is I'll have a global counter, uh, counter or just call it, okay, it is some number which says what is the next number to be processed, okay. This stores the next number to be processed, okay. Initially it is 1, okay. So uh, processor 3 comes up let us say, it will just pick it up, okay. Oh, I have to process 1 and then it will increment, okay. So what was earlier 1 will now, it, the value will be 2 now. So the next processor that comes in will just pick up that value and increment it. Okay. So you maintain a global counter which you keep incrementing okay. and uh, whichever value that counter has the processor that the thread let us assume that each processor has associated with it one thread. The job of the thread is to repeatedly loop okay, till do a loop inside the loop what it will do is to go check the value of the count till increment it and it will use the earlier value of the count to check whether that number is prime or not. Okay. So this is the this is, this is one scheme that you could follow. Okay. But <laughs> the scheme has a flaw. Yes. That's fine. You need not necessarily get all the numbers in sequence but uh, no you are pointing out the flaw. Is that a flaw? That is not necessarily a flaw. It is a flaw if you miss out a number or let us say you process the same number twice. But it is definitely a flaw if you miss out a number. So is it possible that you will miss out a number? Can you see the flaw? Yeah, when one processor is trying to increment that number and use the previous one, the another processor can do the same thing because it is not yet implemented. Yeah, so the point is that, see, every process, every thread will have code which looks like follow, which looks as follows. 
uh, you know while some condition you you check what the value of count is you do count plus plus basically okay is prime count Okay. Font size. Font size. Okay. it is prime you will output it and so on. This is what every, there are 10 threads, each thread does this. But the point is that this n is a local variable for each thread, but this count is global. Okay, it is sitting somewhere in memory where all threads can access it. And what looks like one instruction to us, namely this count plus plus, is actually many steps in your machine. Right? If you want to increment a value in memory, what happens in a machine? The value is first loaded into the CPU, one is added to it and then it is stored back to the same location. Okay? So the point is what happens if let us say count the value of count is let us say 2 okay? and at around the same time two threads, thread A and thread B do these operations. Let us say A equals count a plus plus count equals a or count equals a plus one okay. two threads trying to increment the value of counter at around the same time what are the possible results at the end of this what is the expected result and what what are the possible results What do you expect if two threads increment some variable whose value was initially 2, what is the final value that you would expect? 4, right? Is there anything else that is possible as a result of? After, after the first statement. The, uh, after this statement, let us say. Yeah, the context may get switched to thread B. Yeah. Okay. So this happens first and he is saying that this happens next. Okay. So this happens and that happens and then let us say this happens. Okay. At this value, what is the value of at this point, what is the value of count? Three. three. Okay, the value of count is three here. Okay. Then this might happen after that. This is the fourth instruction. Okay. At this point, what is the value of count? Three. Three, because A was equal to two. Right? The value of count here is three. You expected four, and what you get is three. Do you understand this? This is the point, I mean, so in the morning Kamal was explaining all those various uh, ways of programming concurrency using Java. You would have noticed at some point of time that he used some of the methods were uh, declared to be synchron synchronized. Okay? Synchronized is a mechanism of Java which prevents such problems from occurring. Okay? We will we'll briefly look at how you would solve, you would uh, avoid such problems okay, or solve such problems. Okay. But is the problem clear, clear firstly? Okay. When two threads act in parallel, ah, yes. this may not be so bad. Right. Yeah, because it's because we are just checking the number. Ah, okay, 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 okay. Bigger okay. The bigger problem is to miss uh, this thing. Uh, missing the thing, okay. So let us see if you can, if you might actually miss a number. I do not think that will happen in this because you are incrementing by 1 always. Yeah, but you might end up repeating a lot of work, which in itself is bad. And uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, in, in a, it can happen with three threads, you mean? Oh, or if there are three instructions. A plus A plus 1 is Ah, OK. No, but A is local. A is local. A is local. Yeah. No, but this is still bad because in an extreme case, you might have <laughs> that count never gets incremented beyond one. <laughs> okay, such an extreme case might happen. Okay. 
Okay, because every time you go, the value of count is still one, and uh, you try to do something, it never can it happen. No, that can't happen. It gets it prevented by one at least every time. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So a lot of lot of work gets repeated. Okay, but already that is disastrous enough for us because you don't want to repeat wasteful work. But one can come up with scenarios where things can go awfully wrong. Okay, imagine that uh, thread A and thread B are two accounts, and uh, you want to transfer some money from thread A to thread from the account of A to the account of B. Okay, depending on how things, uh, let's say you are transferring 50 rupees from here to there. Okay, then what would you be doing? Let's write it here. Yeah, no, or or you could have a, or you could these two could be bank accounts, and there could be a third thread, which is some kind of an audit thread, okay, whose job is to go and sum up the balances in all the accounts, okay. So initially the balance was X, even after a transfer the balance ought to be X, but if the audit is happening alongside a transfer, then you might get various kind of spurious values, okay. So it's an exercise. Please think of. A scenario where a simple scenario where there are two accounts, let us say, and there is one audit thread whose job is to, from time to time, sum up the uh, balances in all the accounts. Okay, and uh, if that happens alongside a transfer, then you might get undesirable effects. Okay, and that could be much more disastrous than in this case where all we had to suffer was a uh, some duplication of effort. Whereas there, it might have a graver consequences. Okay. Okay. So now, the point here is that when threads act in parallel, okay, as what this illustrates is that it needn't all be in one shot. Okay. So this hap this thread executes for a while, context switches. Then the other thread executes for a while, context switches to perhaps a third thread, and then it will eventually come back here. But if they are also, no. Uh, manipulating shared variables while doing this, then you might have, uh, depending on with the context switches, okay, depending on the exact interleaving, you might have undesirable effects. Okay, so that is the point of this example. Now, one of uh, any programming language which allows you to do concurrent programming has to provide lots of tools for this. Okay, a variety of tools for handling uh, for uh, handling this problem. Okay, one uh, one typical solution is to use what are called locks. So, how many of you have seen locks before in any kind of programming context? Ah, uh -huh. I mean the usual scenario is scripting. I mean, it doesn't necessarily need a multi-core. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily need a multi-core. Yeah. That, that, that's fine. This is just. In general, general uh, no multi-programming, not necessarily multi-core. Spin locks, you said. Okay, so what are uh, have you actually programmed using spin locks or? Yes, ah, okay. What other kinds of locks are there? Semaphores, mutexes, yes. whatever. Yeah, and then yeah. So spin locks are locks which actually uh, you know which actually do a lot of computation. While I mean they spin through a tight loop, which is why they are called spin locks. Whereas there are other kinds of locks which uh, have a much bigger infrastructure. You know, if you try to lock and if you cannot obtain a lock, you are made to wait actually. Okay, wait in a queue and so on. Whereas spin locks are locks where if you cannot obtain the lock, you will keep checking whether the lock is available as long as it is available. Okay, as long as it is not available. Okay. So, but for people who have not seen locks, okay, just think of it as some mechanism by which, okay, whenever you encounter a shared variable like count, okay, if you have associated a particular lock with this count, okay, then what you can do is you can say a lock, um, let's say count lock, let's call it, okay. So let me clean up this code. 
if you write the cleaned up code here. So what we had earlier was that uh, each of these threads were executing the following code, right? While some condition still holds, increment the counter, I mean n equals count plus plus, and then you check whether n is a prime. Right? This was the code that we had earlier. Since count is a variable that's shared by shared across all these threads, you would basically say count lock dot lock before executing the statement. And once you are done, you will say count lock dot unlock. Okay. So it's just basically what you would intuitively think of it as. Okay. Before you access a shared variable, you sort of lock access to it. Once you have gotten it, no one else can get it. Okay. When you go out, you unlock it. Okay. The point being that if thread A comes, if let's say thread A and thread B are both executing this code. Okay. If thread A gets to lock first, then thread B, when it comes to the lock instruction, it will have to wait. The operating system or the programming language, uh, the language environment, uh, the runtime environment of the language, one of these things will ensure that if the lock has been obtained by one thread, the other threads will wait. Is this clear? So lock is some way by which you can lock out. <laughs> the terminology is meant to be intuitively understandable for, you know, even for someone who has not seen. In fact, if you do a course in concurrent programming, uh, the first few lectures will just be to implement, you know, to look at various algorithms for these locks. Okay, spin locks. He mentioned that's one. Then uh, you can have this notion called monitors, semaphores, monitors. Okay, there are lots. Test and increment. Yeah, test and set is another lock. Okay. Atomic variables. Uh -huh. Atomic variables. What variables? Atomic. Atomic, atomic variables. Yeah. Uh, yes. Atomic variables. They go hand in hand with, uh, you know, test and set. Various things. Some of these solutions are provided at the architecture level. Some of these are provided by your programming language. Okay, which might be implemented in some sense by, in some way by your operating system. Okay. And in fact, it's when you come to some of these locks that you see the difference between single core and multi core machines. Okay. For instance, there is a famous uh, lock implementation using what is called test and set. Okay. This is an instruction provided by some hardware, uh, some hardware architectures. Okay. Uh, it turns out that if you use the most straightforward version of test and set, the algorithm will perform very badly, the program will perform very badly. Okay. Whereas if you use a slightly non-intuitive but a slightly more complicated looking version, it will perform better. And the difference in the performance happens only because of multi-core. Okay? Uh, because of the way in which the caches, the, you know, the different memories and the various associated with the various processors should uh, synchronize and so on. Okay? So some people asked in the morning, what is the difference between what we are doing here and you know, multi-core. Okay? There are certain places like this where the difference becomes apparent. But the aim of research is for it not to become apparent. Okay? You want to provide programming tools which will you know, hide all that complexity in the background. So, I mean, it's, it's a, in fact, we should say it's a failure on the part of the programming language designers that this difference becomes manifest like this. You know? Using test and set in the most obvious manner provides a uh, you know much worse performance than using it in a slightly less obvious. Okay, but that was just a side remark. Okay, so there are various locks. You can think of lock as just locking and then unlocking. Okay, and uh, <coughs> there are various uh, standard problems that you study in concurrent programming. There are various paradigm problems, right? Uh, Kamal mentioned a few in the morning. Barrier synchronization. He mentioned. He also mentioned uh, dining philosophers. Okay, this problem itself is mutual exclusion, the most fundamental of all problems. There is the readers writers problem. Okay, there are various problems and solutions using locks and so on. Okay, for almost all those problems, using semaphores or monitors or this kind of locks. Okay, but what we look at today is a slightly to go to the next step. You can think of these things as protecting an individual data item using a lock. Okay? 
in almost all these solutions, if you want to solve the readers writers problem, then you have a database where people can read from, where people can write into. You treat the database as one whole entity and you lock you lock access to it whenever someone goes to write it. But you also have to satisfy some other properties, so you might need to use more logs, you know, come up with clever designs to satisfy all your requirements. But <coughs> The distinguishing feature between what I am going to do later in this lecture and all those paradigm problems is that here in those problems you use a lock to uh, control access to one single data item. Whereas now what I will talk about is how do you, when you go up to data structures, okay, how do you, how do you manage concurrent access? Okay? And the example that I want to use to illustrate some of the issues that arise is a linked list. Okay. So I'll now take this off and we'll move to linked list. Any questions so far? So how how one typically uses a lock is clear, right? even for people who have not seen it before. If you want to access a shared variable, you first, anyone who tries to access it first locks it and then unlocks it. Okay? The first person to get hold of the lock will go ahead. All the other people, they will have to wait. Okay? You mentioned spin locks. In spin lock, they will have to wait. While they wait, they will keep looping. Okay? Whereas there are some other kinds of locks, monitors for instance, where you won't do any active work, but you will be put to sleep by the system. So that's basically it. Let's move to linked lists. Okay. So we'll, I mean, since we'll keep it very simple. We want to maintain a linked list of integers. Okay. A singly linked list. So there is a head. All the way till you have a tail. There is a head pointer, but there might not necessarily be a tail pointer. Okay, and we'll always assume that head holds the least integer, min, and uh, tail holds the max integer. So even if it's an empty list, you will have min and max in it. Okay, and we'll also assume that we are going to uh, maintain elements in this list in sorted order. Okay, we'll make all these simplifications, and still you will see that there are. I mean, <laughs> only if we consider a simple enough data structure, we can study issues in concurrency. Okay? Otherwise, we will be studying data structure and <laughs> complexity of the algorithms and so on. Okay? Fine. Um, so, everyone knows, right, how to, so we will we'll consider three operations. Okay? Add is one operation, remove is one operation, and contains is another operation. We will make a further simplification and say that entries are all unique. So add, if the entry is already found there, it will return a false. Okay? The entry is not found there, it will add the element and then return a true. Remove, if the entry is found, it will remove and return a true. If the entry is not found, it will return a false. Is that clear? Contains, of course, will return true if it is there, return false if it is not there. Okay? Fine. So, yeah. So now the problem is, we have a, we, you can think of many scenarios where this can happen, right? So imagine some game where two players are playing and they have to, you know, some actual computer game where two, pe two, two people are playing and the people who are playing will be two threads typically, okay? And they'll have to maintain some shared data, let us say. And uh, imagine that that is maintained as a linked list, okay? And you want either of these people to add or remove or check do this contains query at any point of time. Okay? And it need not just be two, but it could be more than two. So you want to allow concurrent threads to access one shared linked list. Okay? So what would be your first algorithm? Let's say your neighbor's algorithm or the the first cut algorithm. <laughs> Not the first element. 
okay and then log uh, yeah so you should tell me you uh -huh. no i want in fact in fact let's let's follow kamal's thing and uh, let's define an abstract data type for linked lists okay so you will have uh, and the first okay of course i want to consider i call this course list and you know why i am calling this course list in a minute okay and uh, you have to declare some class public class course list or whatever okay of course it should have a node okay it will have one node at least head and head will have a next to it and uh, node itself contains node itself is uh, it has int data and it has a pointer to next node this is node and list will have a head okay what else will it have okay so he said lock the first node when okay so no you have to you have to give an implementation of all three operations there is a public add public boolean add you have to give code for that there is a public boolean remove take in bringing in this kind of representation because i need to mention some java specific thing when i go into the code but i will come to that in a minute so you need to give code for all these three things okay so he said so the simplest thing you would do is to like i said consider the whole linked list as one data item so you would associate a lock with the whole list so you will have a lock class let us say lock lock equals okay so this is a this thing okay and uh, when you in the constructor or whatever you will basically say this is a new whatever whatever your favorite lock is okay the like kamal mentioned in the morning this lock is an interface this reentrant lock is some implementation of that you could have any kind of implementation of lock you could have a blocking lock you could have you know various kinds of lock various kinds of spin lock spin locks okay but reentrant lock is let's say one lock so this is an actual concrete lock that you associate with the whole list okay and then what do you do if you want to add you need to basically go through this list to find two positions where this element is smaller that element is larger okay and you will have to insert the element in this position or if one of these things is equal then you will say you will return false right but before you do it you will basically lock you will basically obtain this lock so all these so i will use i'll write code for add here the first thing add will do is to say lock dot lock okay and then it will find the position if element is there if element is present return false else return to else insert and return to and then finally you will unlock the lock so this will be the pattern of the code okay and i am calling it coarse list because it's what you might call coarse grained concurrency okay you are viewing this whole list as one element you know which you can lock so you can you can become more fine grain but first let's look at this and remove will be similar okay to begin with you will obtain the lock you will do whatever is needed to be done and at the end you will unlock the thing okay contains doesn't it so happens doesn't need to do any uh but let's just make contains also lock and unlock Okay. Yeah, because while contains is happening, someone else might come and you know remove the position, remove something. But it so turns out that I'll, I'll if I have time, I'll discuss that. It so turns out that you don't need to do anything with contains. Contains can just without locking do uh, 
search for the position of the element and return true or false. Okay. You don't want queries like contains to lock and unlock because tip, in a typical data structure, okay, you will these kind of queries will be yeah will be much more than the operations that modify the data structure. Okay. So you would want to keep these kind of queries as uh, efficient as possible. Okay. Yeah. You are locking that one. No, this there is one. There is one. See, lock is a class. Okay, some implementation. So it is associated with this list. Okay. So every time any thread tries to do any operation on the list, it will first lock it. Okay. It will first lock this lock. Which means what? If thread A first gets the lock. If thread B comes and tries the same lock operation, it will have to wait. Okay, fine. So no two operations can happen on the list at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> Who's leaving? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is the point. So. <coughs> So let's try to look at the okay. What is there is one advantage to this code, which is that it's easy to prove correct. <laughs> and you might ask, what is there to prove correct in a linked list algorithm? You'll see in a minute. Okay, <laughs> when we go to uh, more involved solutions. Okay. Yeah, one virtue of it is that it is easily shown to be correct. But and that shouldn't be discounted, of course. Okay, because. And there are situations where this might be fine. Okay, let's say you want to provide access to uh, some shared data structure to various people, but you know that it is very rare that uh, two people at around the same time try to access it. Then you don't need to break your head trying to get a very involved algorithm. You just do this. If you can somehow, if if your program is such that concurrent access are, uh, accesses are rare, then it's fine. Okay, but concurrent accesses are not rare. Okay, so there are situations where there could be a lot of concurrent access, in which case uh, this is bad and it is especially bad because if I try to add something here and uh, let us say Venkatesh tries to remove something here, okay, I mean there is no reason why these two things should lock each other out, right? because whatever pointer manipulations I do here it is not going to affect what he is doing, whatever he does is not going to affect what I am doing. So you want to avoid this this kind of a scenario where you know operations happening at some two far away locations in the data structure lock each other out okay so therefore you might want to go to something called a fine list this is a fine grained list okay and what is the finer grain of control here instead of the list at the node level okay thankfully i have this still so each node now each node has a lock associated with it. Okay. And not the list. This can be a re-entrant lock or two. I mean, this is not syntactically correct Java code or something. <laughs> I'm just giving you some sense of what is happening. Okay. So each node has a lock associated with it. And what you do is you lock nodes as you go along. Okay, fine. So how would code for add look now? We need to get a little more precise here. So you have to have a predecessor pointer which will point to end. Okay, you are going to add some x here. Okay. Current pointer which will be head dot next. And what are you looking at? You want to look at whether uh, predecessor dot value is le less than x and current dot value is greater than x. Okay. So basically, what you want to do is you want to do a loop where while current dot data, whatever you call it. 
you keep advancing these two pointers. Once you come out of the loop, you want to check if if it's equal to x, then you have to do something. Uh, then you return false. Else, what do you do? Create a new node. new node is a new node with value x and uh, you will basically say print dot next okay. this will be the code but <laughs> what if two people try to do the same thing at around the same time then there will be conflicts right I am not locking it at the list level so I have to lock it at the node level okay and in locking it at the node level you know now various choices have to be made okay you could just lock one of these two nodes or you could lock both these nodes okay so exactly so you just need to lock the predecessor always because finally what you are going to change is suppose the node is going to x is going to go between print and cur then what is going to be changed is the next pointer of print so it's enough to lock print yeah so but no 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 you can't do that because as you are proceeding as you are doing this thing ah that's a this thing as you are as you are as you are doing this thing remove might come and remove some Okay, so you know, one thread is trying to add, another thread is trying to remove, and you might actually go out of the. You know, you might actually end up. Yeah. So this problem might. It's it's not enough. I mean, it's it's not enough to lock only outside of the loop because look at this example. Okay, you are trying to. Um, let's let's try some example. Yeah, right. You are trying to add some x. Let us say. Okay, you are going along this path. Okay, let's say you are trying to add 50. Okay, as you are going along this thing, let's say the data values here are uh, 20, 25, 30. Let's say. Okay, at this point, okay, so after this, in the original list was 35. Okay, and after this was 60. Let's say. Okay you are proceeding along this line okay and what happens is that uh, yeah just at the point yeah just at the point where you have to go from here to there okay another thread might remove 35 okay in which case what might happen what will happen is that there will be a this edge will be broken Okay. and that edge will be added but this edge will still be there okay and what you have done is as part of your code you have pred and you have cur, cur dot next and all that is there you have determined that something is uh, um, just a second uh, yeah basically you will insert this thing between yeah I am trying to figure out yeah you will end up inserting 50 between 35 and 60 and the outside of the loop and this might happen because just oh, you might have determined what cur dot next is okay because remember this operation we should go back to this thing at a level of a machine this operation is not one atomic operation you have to read cur dot next into the cpu then you have to assign it to something and then write it back to cur okay you have read cur dot next to be this okay the next time you get control you have assigned it to cur so you have actually moved here even though you ought to move there okay and you have now inserted it here so, so you need to lock every node as you go along okay and not just that okay here at least okay uh, you need to lock at least one node you know each thread which you are going to modify you need to keep locking it let's look at the code for remove remove should act similarly right 
it should search for the position and once it comes here what it will do is instead of doing this it will say if cur dot data is greater than x then it will return false with equal to x then it will then it will set pred dot next to cur dot next okay so for remove the code here till now will be similar but here it should say if cur dot data is greater than x return false uh, return uh, yeah return false else pred dot next equals cur dot next return true oh yeah the java specific thing i said was that see the spread cur and so on are names that you use inside the definition of this list okay but i am when i am trying to explain these things i am trying to make it sound as if the spread cur and so on are variables that are local to a thread yeah so this you are, you can manage that thing by using something called thread local variables in java okay java allows you to do it other there are other languages also that allow you to do it okay the point is that see, you have to <laughs> you have to consider all these things when you write concurrent programs you want to describe objects okay concurrent objects you know which allow concurrent threads to access them and you want to have a uniform description of these objects okay but you want certain things to remain local the spread cur and so on should remain local to each thread okay so this is the java specific thing i wanted to say but it's allowed in other languages too anyway this is the code for remove No, 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 no. But the point, is, no. But the point is that each time a thread tries to access it, okay, it should be. If they are local to the procedure itself, then okay. they will be already. Uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, there is a need for thread lock. Yeah, that's true. But sometimes, okay, thread and curve is fine. But sometimes you need no. But you, okay, so thread lock variables. What they do is. they will not be re recreated every time at the same thread see if they are just local variables then they will be recreated every time the function is called yeah. but thread local variables they will be created once for each thread identity okay so i mean it's some this thing but so if you don't get it ignore the last <laughs> minute like, comments like huh? static within the thread yeah exactly it's static within the thread so is it clear what is happening in add and remove but except i have not put any locks here i have already told you that you need to lock pred because add along with remove will create problems now <laughs> remove itself requires you to not lock just one node but two nodes okay we'll see how okay you so the point is that you need to lock both pred and cur every time okay and then when you move you need to lock the next thing and then unlock this so this is called hand over hand locking so you always have two nodes locked at any point of time sometimes three okay at intermediate stages okay so the reason for two locks is this this is a um look at the thing i don't think i can enter let's see so this is head and it points to a which points to b which points to c so can someone think of a problem that will happen when you lock only pred because pred is the one that needs to be locked right? if anything has to be locked because pred is being modified okay you are you are modifying pred dot next to make it equal to current right you are modifying the data itself okay so you need to lock pred so initially okay let's say let's say there are two threads one of which is trying to remove a the other is trying to remove b okay let's see what might happen and everyone locks spread alone so each code tries to lock spread alone make spread dot next equal to cur dot next right so you will make this point to c b is not removed at all okay is it clear let me go over it again This was the original list. Oh, I'll use some colored chalks. 
they look good at all. Hopefully, one can distinguish these two colors. Let's see on the board. So there is a thread A, okay, which tries to remove a thread B tries to remove B. Okay, thread A goes through the list, and uh, it is at the point where cur is equal to A and print is equal to head. Okay, so head is being locked. So you put a lock here. So there is a lock here. Okay, now thread B goes ahead and locks this. Okay. Thread B searches all the way to B, where cur is equal to B and pred is equal to A. Uh, A. Huh? So thread B locks this. Yeah. So now thread A goes ahead and removes node A. How does it do it? It says, so this is pred A. So let me pred sub B A. And cur sub B. Okay. This is also a spread sub B. Is it clear? Okay. So at this point, it says, "Oh, spread A dot next should be equal to carrier dot next." So this guy deletes this and redirects this all the way there. Okay. What will this guy do next? You say, "Oh, spread spread B dot next is equal to car B dot next." So I'll do this. This guy will modify this and put it all the way. Uh, no, wrong color. <laughs> okay. So, but on the other hand, if both print and car are locked at all the time, then what will happen? This will be locked. That will be locked. Okay. And uh, if for thread A, both these things will be locked. For thread B, both these things should be locked before any action happens at all. But two threads can't lock this node at the same time. Okay, according to the very definition of locks. I mean, according to the yeah. So therefore, you will avoid this problem by locking both pred and cur at the same time. Okay. So this is one illustration of a problem that could occur. So typically in this code, what you will need to do is to lock both pred and cur. Okay, and then once you advance the pointer, you need to lock the new thing and then unlock the earlier. Okay, so I'll not write the explicit code here. At the end, I'll give the reference to the book which will contain all this code. I'm sure the code made is common enough to be found elsewhere on the internet too. But I'll give it at the end. Okay. Is the algorithm clear? So as you go along this list. You have two. You have two pointers, spread and curve, point into two nodes. You lock both of them. Before you advance, you lock the new node, unlock the earlier one, and you keep going. Like this. Okay, fine. So one more thing you might ask is, um, you know, should I first lock spread and then curve, or should I first lock curve and then spread? First lock spread and curve. Whichever is fine, but you need to uh, both these processes to follow a uniform policy. Because if you said add will first lock pred and then cur, and if you said remove will first lock cur uh, and then pred, then there might be deadlock. Okay, because you might be at a point where this guy has locked the A has locked this and is waiting to lock that. Okay, whereas B has locked this and is waiting to lock this. You don't want such deadlocks to happen. Okay, so you see how things. So typically you will encounter deadlocks in a concurrency programming course when you deal with the, Algorithms for mutual exclusion or some such things, but those are involved algorithms, and it will always look a little contrived, you know, because these might not occur in real life. You might think, but here is a real life scenario where you you will immediately get into deadlocks if you didn't program it right. Okay. So, uh, other algorithms like uh, lock multiple things, but if uh, one of them fails, then unlock everything and keep trying. Yeah, yeah, you could do. Right? Yes, you could do that. Yes. Yeah, you could do that. Uh, fine. So, uh, how will contains work again? So, contains will contains needn't lock anything actually. Contains could just because it's it's only saying true or false. Okay, it can just go through the uh, list and but <laughs> there might be problems. It yeah. So, here is the point to discuss when I should discuss that.
suppose your contains was a very simple routine which just started from beginning to end till it found the element. Okay, if it is there, it will say yes. If it if it's not, it will say no. What might happen is that as your uh, so this is your list. As your contains proceeds through this list, okay. Remember, contains is not doing any locking. So if you have to wait for each other and so on, then you need to also lock. That is the fundamental thing. So one thread says node dot lock, okay. Another thread also has to say node dot lock for it to wait. If it doesn't do anything, then it can just go ahead. Okay. So this contains the code that disregards all lock and goes ahead. Okay. As it goes ahead, let us say it is at this point. Okay, and uh, it has to next do cur dot cur equals cur dot next. Okay, it has determined that that cur dot next is this node here. Okay, so it will have to do that assignment. But before it does this assignment, okay, after it has determined cur dot next and before it assigns it to cur, somebody comes and removes it. That's not a problem. Yeah, that's what I want to illustrate. <laughs> so somebody comes and removes it. Okay, so what would your, what would the contains routine do? So this is x, let us say, and you want to do contains of x. You want to, you want to say whether x is contained in the list or not. So you went ahead, and just before you went and saw this thing, okay, somebody came and removed this x. But what would you do? What would this contains routine do? This thread will just go there, see x, and say, oh, yes, x is present in the list. You know, question is, is it correct or not? Yeah, this is the this is an important thing. See, the point is when we pointed out flaws, it was obvious what the flaws were. But when we want to say that something is correct, you want to know, you know, you want to have a much more refined notion of correctness now than you had for sequential comp computation. The point is that this contains routine happens oh, in time. It starts at some point of time and it goes on for a while. And the remove routine also happens for a while. Okay, when these two things happen. When these two things overlap in time, okay, it is okay to say. I mean, when you view the final results, okay, it could either be the case if you you might either observe that that happened first and then this after that, or that this happened first and then that. Okay, so things that overlap in time, you can order them in any way you want. But there are certain consistency conditions that you need to follow when you, you know, when you say that you can order them in any way that you want. Okay, so there is one notion called linearizability. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go into that, and it's a technical notion, so it's a little difficult to motivate. Also, there is another notion called sequential consistency. Okay, you need to follow some of these. So these are the usual notions of correctness that you follow. Okay, because even the notion of correctness is subtle here because things overlap in time, okay, and either order could be thought of as admissible. Okay, fine. So contains works this way. Now I'll have to. <laughs> okay, this is a reasonable enough improvement because if things happen, you know, if something happens at the end of the list and then something, and after that something happens at the beginning of the list, they don't need to overlap. But still, there is a problem, right? <laughs> if if one thread wants to access the second element in the list, and another thread wants to access the tenth element in the list. Okay, A wants to access the second element, B wants to access the tenth element. Okay, clearly B has to follow A. If A goes first, then B will have to follow A. Yeah, so A will first lock this, and then lock that. B will have to wait for A to release those locks before it can proceed. Okay, so this is again a not a very desirable situation. Okay. So one goes for refinements of this. Okay, there is a refinement of this called optimistic linked lists, where when you search for the element, you don't do any locks at all. You go all the way without locking. But once you have found the element, this is when you want to do the pointer manipulation. Then you lock the elements. Okay, but then because everybody is proceeding without locking, you need to check whether things are correct. So you need to go back to the head of the list. And come all the way down to see if both pred, if pred is accessible 
and if spread dot next is actually equal to current. Okay, you don't you need to do both these things. Okay, so uh, I mean, so this is like some a tourist goes to a new country and uh, takes a cab ride. The cab driver jumps all the red lights, <laughs> and every time <laughs> this tourist is <laughs> scared to death, he's asking what he is doing. The driver says, "Don't worry, I am an expert." Fine, but suddenly at a green light, the driver stops. <laughs> this guy asks, "What happened?" <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but there are other experts too. So I have to be careful now. <laughs> so this is the point. As long as there are, as long as you have not found your element, you just keep going ahead disregarding logs. But when you have found your element, you don't immediately do the modification, but you lock the things and go back and check. But this introduces one new thing. Firstly, you know it's not one traversal but two traversals. You do this traversal once and then you go back and check whether the you lock these two elements alone. And then you go back and check whether they are. proper but what if they are not proper this is the question so you went ahead and found your element you have pred and cur you have locked them you want to check whether nobody else has modified it you know between the time i determined that this was the point and when i locked it fine if you go and do this validation routine and if it is found to be not valid then you repeat the whole process all over again okay so but the point is, i mean so in an extreme case it might lead to starvation you might keep you know going back to the head of the list all the time but in practice it might i mean such a thing will be very rare and you are anyway saving on the cost of locking each and every node as you go okay you are doing only you are locking only two things okay and okay so this is this has to be justified only by your <laughs> by empirical tests and on what kind of operations you know your link list, i mean what kind of manipulations happen in your links okay so it depends on your program okay but in practice it might be fine and starvation is very rare usually practice even though it's theoretically possible okay so this is you might do this refinement of not locking at every step but locking only after you have found it and doing the validation the next step you might go for is to say that okay why do i need to do this i mean the validation routine that we had had to go back to the head of the list and search all the way instead you might say okay you might simplify the validation routine a little bit if you did two things you know associate with each no what a mark which says whether a logical mark which says whether it is in the list or not okay and the remove routine first marks it as outside the list and then physically removes the link okay so now validation routine might be will be much easier okay because all you need to check is whether it, the node is marked or Okay, you don't need to go back to the head of the list and check and so on. You are here. Once you have found the two nodes, you just check whether neither of neither node is marked and if the pred dot next is equal to current. Okay, that's all you need. And again, the correctness of all these things, you'll have to go back to this. If things overlap in time, then either result is fine. Okay, if a remove happens alongside a contains, it could say yes, it could say no. Okay, but it should be logically consistent according to. You know, some there are some minimal logical constraints that you'll put. Okay, in fact, almost all these data structures are what are called linearizable. Okay, which is a very strong condition that you can. Okay, so I think I should stop with this, but I'll mention just one more data structure. Okay, so linked list is something where operations naturally happen at various ends. So you would think you would think that a linked list is a data structure that is naturally parallelizable. You can grant concurrent access. Okay, naturally, there are some other data structures where it doesn't seem so obvious. Let's consider a stack. Okay, every element that has to, I mean, you want a shared stack to be shared by many concurrent process, concurrent threads. Everybody has to have, everybody has to modify the top of the stack. So there has to be a lock. I mean, <laughs> whether you consider it as a fine grained lock or a coarse grained lock, you have to lock the top. So where is the concurrency here? It looks like it's almost sequential. Okay, people have found clever solutions for this. Okay, one solution is to say, go check the top of the stack. If it is locked, then don't try immediately again. So this you might have seen even in spin locks and so on. You do what is called exponential back off. Okay, first time you find that it's locked, you back off and come back after a random amount of time, between zero and two seconds, let us say. Okay, seconds is too large. Let's say zero and two time units. then if you again find it locked you you back off 
and then you come back at a random time between 0 and 4 time units and so on. So, this is called exponential back off till some point. Okay. You can do exponential back off and hope that you know the <laughs> the randomness will take care of the fact that you know when you come there it is not locked. But you can do even better. Okay. You can this clearly utilizes the fact that uh, uh, utilizes the nature of stack operations. If somebody does a push and somebody else does a pop then it needn't necessarily you needn't necessarily do it right. You can eliminate the you can cancel the two operations. So, when you back off okay you don't come back to the stack okay you go to an auxiliary array where the various threads okay so you pick a random index in this array okay and uh, swap whatever value it has with whatever value you have suppose you want to push okay you enter push here okay and then you take whatever value is there so there might be some initial there might be some value which says only one element till now okay in which case you have to wait for some other element to arrive here okay if you wait for a while and no other element arrives here you will just delete your entry here and go to the stack again okay but some other entry might have, some other thread might choose the same random index and what might happen is that that thread will swap its value with this okay if this was a push and that, that was a pop then the two will cancel each other out and not even go to the stack if both are pops then it's fine that's a pop this is a pop nothing happens you go back to the stack again if both are pushes that's also fine this was a push x that was a push y both will go i mean you started out the push x you went to this array and tried to do some exchange you exchanged it for a push y so you go back to the stack okay but the nice thing is that if a push and pop meet in this array then they'll cancel each other out okay so this okay so this is one way by which you know you look at data structures which don't even seem like they'll they have scope for concurrent access and you can do it okay and access to this array is concurrent okay i mean you array is after all you're just picking a random index in the array and you're just trying to lose and there are no locks or anything in this right okay uh, so this is just to tell you that you know you can do lots of fancy stuff with uh, you know starting from simple things okay so i think i'll end here if there are any questions you can Finally, uh, it's not unique, eh? Yeah, that that is fine. You don't want, yeah. You just want the pushes to happen. You do not want the order to happen in the exact. Time. I mean, yeah, this is all concurrent. This goes back to the notion of correctness that we talked about when when a when a remove and a contains overlaps, right? When two pushes overlap, what is the what do you want the result of the final stack to be? It could either be this or that. Okay. Unlike in sequential algorithms where you want an exact order here there is no such thing anything else so i hope the basic list algorithms and the issues that arise here at least were clear okay yeah ah yes so so there is this excellent book by Morris Herlihy and Neer Shavit. It's called Art of Multiprocessor Programming. And whatever I presented was from chapter nine of is from chapter nine of that book. Okay, but that book is I mean, if you want to understand uh, concurrency issues that arise in multi-core uh, architectures, this is the book too. I mean, this is one of the best references out there. Okay, these two. I mean, the the, the two authors are Gödel Prize winners, in fact, for related work.